I get so wrecked up, so messed up, and when I see and feel the presence of God. Uh, so, <laughs> man, I, I just, I enjoy those moments. Um, there's some, something so beautiful about it. Makes you forget all that happens around you. That's how beautiful it is. Are you with me? Hebrews chapter 11 from verse 23. If you this, Amen. Book of Hebrews chapter 11 verse 23. By faith Moses after his birth was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful and divinely favored child. So they saw the favor of God over this child as small as he was. And they were not afraid of the king, king's decree. By faith Moses when he had grown up refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter because he preferred to endure the hardship of the people of God rather than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin he considered the reproach or the criticism of the Christ that is like the rebuke he would suffer for his faithful obedience to God to be greater wealth than all the treasures of Egypt for he looked ahead to the reward what was the reward the promise of God may the Lord bless the reading of his word you may be seated this morning we will start from where we left last week and we started on the three mentals. Everybody said three mentals. What are those three mentals? A prophetic mentor. And I said, I highlighted a couple of things from Malachi. How the spirit of Elijah is still yet to fulfill his mandate upon the earth. And we had gone through a series of messages on the spirit of Elijah. And last week we started to unfold the royal priesthood because Revelation calls us kings and priests. Are you with me? And I also shared with you that we have also minister, we have also learned and I shared with you on the Melchizedek order of priesthood which was a king and priest. So it was a royal priesthood because Melchizedek was king and priest of Salem. So Jesus royal Jesus priesthood is order the after the order of Melchizedek and not the Levitical order that's why he will be called prince he will be called the prince of peace and he will be called the king of kings and the lord of lords and he will also be called according to the word of God in Hebrews the great high priest so Jesus will be king he is king and he is high priest and it was not allowed in the old testament you cannot be both king and priest in fact Saul will lose, lose his kingdom because he tried to perform a sacrifice and God was not pleased and God says I will take your kingdom away from you because you have acted foolishly God would not allow Saul as a king to be the priest or act as a prophet because they were two separate officers but in the new covenant when God started to unravel the mystery of royal priesthood we have an understanding that we as the children of God are the priests because Jesus becomes the high priest and we become his brothers in the kingdom so we are now ushered into the royal priesthood of God and then he calls us into royalty because our father is the king and because we become part of his kingdom so revelation says that he has called us both kings and priests unto himself and we could not be both king and priest in the old covenant. That's why our priesthood is after the order of Melchizedek. And that's why we are royal priesthood. All messages combined is a whole series we've been through having an understanding. Now we have reached a point of having the grip of priesthood. What is the priesthood? And I shared with you even though our priesthood is order the, uh, after the order of Melchizedek. There is no reference in the scripture than to have an understanding of priesthood then of Levites. Amen? 
So even the priesthood that was fulfilled in Christ Jesus was the priesthood of Levi that was fulfilled. Because he becomes the ultimate Lamb of God. He fulfilled the law. And what was law given to? It was given to the priest. Who were the priests? The Levites. So he fulfilled the priesthood of who? The Levite priesthood. So I said to you that the priesthood of Levi becomes the foreshadow of the priesthood of believers. Even though we are not part of the Levite priesthood. But the anointing, the grace and, and the foreshadowing of what happened and how it happened in the priesthood of Levi becomes a pattern for you and I to fulfill. Not the sacrificial pattern or the legalistic pattern of the priesthood because we are not cutting the, the sheep anymore. That was all satisfied and fulfilled in Christ himself. But we're talking about the pattern of the anointing that was upon Levite. So we're discussing now the royal priesthood and we're discussing who we're discussing Levites and last week I established a little bit of foundation on on Moses because Moses become the father of Levi the, the Levite tribe the father figure of the Levite tribe because he was the Levi are you with me we understood a couple of things about this anointing when, when God trusts this anointing of Levitical order or the priesthood order to the saints and I shared with you is a presence chasing or presence seeking mantle. And I won't repeat the whole message of last week so we, un we have an understanding for all those who were not here last week where are we heading to in this second message on the priesthood of the children of God. Bible speaks of Moses and we, we are unfolding and unraveling the life of Moses. And last week we, we heard from Exodus 33 that he was, he was seeking the presence of God. And I shared with you that he was 40 years in palace becoming a royal and 40 years in the house of priest of Midian Jethro becoming acquainted with the ways of priest. And after that order was fulfilled, 40 years in the palace and 40 years in the house of a priest called Jethro the Midianite, he was now ready to lead the people of God. Because even today we will have the, the, the marrying of these two orders coming very strongly. Now we read that Bible says that he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. And he preferred, he preferred to endure the hardship of the people of God. He had all the means to enjoy life because he was raised in palace. But the grace upon him and the call of being a Levi and call of him being connected. What does Levi mean? Somebody who connects. We learned that last week. We a little bit highlighted of the life of Leah as well. Why she will call him Levi. His purpose was to connect. And his, his anointing over his, over his life was to connect. And that yearning we find over and over coming so strong in his life. That he was connected with the things of heaven. That's why the earthly pleasures did not mean anything to him. That's why being raised as a prince and being cherished as a ruler did not bother him because he was connected with something that was supernatural. And he refused the pleasures of the palace. God went looking for a deliverer and he found Moses. Why? Because the anointing and the grace and the call of his life to be a Levi, he will devalue the earthly pleasures. And he will value.
value the call and purpose of God more than anything else in his life. And that's why whenever God picks up people, he's not searching for people who are religious, who are gifted, who are very spiritual. God is searching people who are connected to him and who devalue the earthly possessions. They're not entrusted in the portfolios. They're not entrusted in the positions. They born God and they want to serve God even if they have a position or not. Moses become that example for us that he will refuse. He will prefer to endure and the, the hardship and the persecution but he will refuse the pleasures and the names and being called the prince he rather call himself a slave a Hebrew slave than being called the prince of Egypt his Bible says he preferred reproach what is reproach? criticism backbiting ridicule Bible says he rather go through criticism and know and do what God is asking him to do than be a people pleaser I can never be a people pleaser for me good is good bad is bad this is white and this is black there's no gray areas many will have a problem with me and they will continue to because I cannot compromise the grace and the anointing and the call of God over my life because if I compromise I will compromise the anointing that flows out of me his father says he preferred he considered the reproach the criticism I'd rather have that and then disobey God because he was connected with the things of heaven one of the reasons Levites will not have the inheritance upon the earth turn your Bible with me to Deuteronomy chapter 18 verse 1 Deuteronomy the book of Deuteronomy chapter 18 verse 1 Let's have an understanding of what's happening with this tribe. Bible says the priests and the Levites, all the tribe of Levi. You must understand that they were in thousands, so not everybody could serve in the temple. Well, listen to this very carefully. The priests, the Levites, and all the tribe of Levi shall have no part nor inheritance with Israel. They shall eat the offerings of Jehovah made by fire and his inheritance. Whose inheritance? God's inheritance. Therefore they shall have no inheritance among their brothers. Jehovah God is their inheritance. As he has said to them. God says you can give land and when they when they got into the promised land each one were given a portion but Levi had no portion of any land God said they belong to me and all of them they belong to me some of the blessings over their lives and we hopefully next week we'll discuss them it was so God was so zealous over them because they became God's possession God became their inheritance. He says they will have no land. I want their heart to be completely given to me. They mustn't even desire to have a land. So you rather just take that off from the law, from your writings. That Levi's are my possession. And I am their inheritance. My father had two properties, have two properties in Pakistan, worth millions. Five years ago I had to make a decision and I gave over those properties to my brother because he's serving God in, in that country. I went before God a couple of years ago, I think just after when we were married, because I don't own a house. And the house, the property that we have belongs to my wife and I honor her for that. But in the grace upon my life we have built churches. 
We literally started, pioneered, dug the foundation and put up buildings. And that grace carries on upon me. Wherever we have been, we've been just given the land. No matter wherever I was. Because the grace and the anointing over my life, the call over my life will attract for us to do the, pro, the, the building of the churches. It's the grace. Because even though David desired to build the temple of the Lord, God forbid him to build the temple. Why? He says, you will not touch brick. You will not build me a house. But your son will. Because it is a certain kind of grace that God bestows upon people's life. Prophet James told me in USA in May, in June when we were there. And I was very, uh, there was just a burden lifted from my, my life. And I, I had prayed about it and I, was just, I just wanted that peace. And he said to me, you will continue to build, but God is your inheritance. Yes. And it, didn't, it, 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 it just refreshed my spirit. Yes. It says you will have the possessions of the lands, but they will not be yours. God will use you to build. And, and it brought comfort. The man did not know me much. After, the, after, the, after I ministered the word of God, he came and started to massage me. He's 75, 78 years old. This white dude, and he started to pray in tongues and, and started to massage my feet and, and legs. And I felt so humble. I says, no, please, prophet, don't do that. He says, no, I have to. The Lord has asked me to do this. And as he was he massaging my feet after this powerful session, and there he's doing this, and then, then he started to prophesy, and this word came out of his mouth, and it really shook me. It's like God gave me an answer that I've been seeking. Amen. He says, don't seek inheritance. Don't seek to build a kingdom. You are my possession and I'm your inheritance. When the grace of the Levitical order comes upon you and the anointing comes over your life, God enables you to achieve extraordinary greater things beyond your capacity. Amen. That anointing their possession, they were the possession of God. Levitical mental, in the Levitical mental, we don't possess possessions. We don't possess possessions. We possess God and He possesses us. That's why in the priesthood of God, the houses that you own, they're not yours. You belong to Him. They become God's. The businesses that you own, everything that you have is not yours. When He calls you priests and kings, He wants all of you and not part of you. It demands everything from your life. That your heart must be connected with heaven so in tune that you know what he says. You do what he do and you are following him. And you, once you are connected, you connect heavens to the earth in the earthly realm where you are. You bring the kingdom down because the blueprints of heavens, they will be given the blueprints of heaven to write down. The hand of God will come and write down, Moses, take this. This is in my heart. They talk with God face to face. They are possessed by God. I know where I belong in the kingdom. I cannot be faced. No matter wherever I am, the hand of God, because I was consecrated on a good Friday, my father did not wait. <laughs> he took me to the church when he got a news, your wife gave birth. I was still with some blood on me when I was rushed into the church. I was born at home. I said to the pastor, Pastor, it's my firstborn, and every firstborn that be, comes out of the womb belongs to the Lord. This is my son. Dedicate him now. 
I know the mantle over my life. I know the grace of God. I know what I'm talking about and speak of God possessing us and He becomes our inheritance. Exodus, turn your Bibles with me to Exodus chapter 17. So Moses did not fight any fights. Did you know that? He was never seen in a battlefield as a Levite because Levites were not allowed to be in the battlefield. How powerful is that? Turn your Bible with me to Exodus chapter 17. If you there, say Amen. I'm going to skip first few verses because I love them, but that's for another time. I went through it and I was so tempted and we would have gone in a totally different direction. But let's just turn to verse 8. Baal says, Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. Verse 9, And Moses said unto, Je unto Joshua, His name but then was Yeshia. Joshua's name was that time Yeshia. So, he turned unto Joshua, and this is what he's telling him, chose us out men and go out fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of, hill, of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. With what? Rod. Say rod. rod. <coughs> There's so much heavens download on the rod and I'm, I'm just excited about it. So Joshua did as Moses has said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses... Aaron and her, everybody say her, went up to the top of the hill and it came to pass when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hand were heavy. He's a human so he got tired. And they took a stone and put it under him. And he sat therefore thereon, and Aaron and Ur stayed up his hand, the one on the one side and the other on the other side, and his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. And the Lord said to Moses, write this in the book as a memorial and recite it to Joshua that I will utterly wipe out the memory of Amalek and his people from under the heaven. And Moses built an altar and named it. That is my banner. This is Jehovah God introduces himself as Jehovah Nisi, the Lord our banner. This is the first time he uses his name as Nisi. Saying the Lord has sworn an oath. The Lord will have war against people from generation to generation. So the battle who, who stood up against the children of God, the battle carries on with them generations after generations. Now this is the incident happening after they received the water from the rock in, in Exodus 17. This is not the rock that he strikes two times. This is before that. And the Bible says they come to a place called Rephidim. What does Rephidim mean? Rephidim means resting place. So they have found some rest. They have found some comfort. And while they were still resting and being comforted and enjoying this water, Bible says Emily came from Norway and attacked Israel. I thank God for the men like Joshua. Because this will be the first battle of Israel. For 400 years, they have been slaved and they are not used to the sword and the bows and arrows anymore. I won't be surprised if they were fighting with kitchen knives. Because they had no weapon with them. They've been just redeemed in Exodus 15 speaks of the song of celebration. They are still celebrating and they go through this wilderness and now they're thirsty and God makes a way for them to have water and all of a sudden there is an enemy because as they pass through they cross the territory of the enemy called Amalek. 
and they came heavy on them. And I thank God people like Joshua that says, okay, get your broomsticks and mops and whatever you got, enemies upon us and let's fight. The command came from Moses, gather the men. Go from camp to camp and see who's muscular, who's strong. I know it's 400 years we've been slain. Find me strong men and fight. Joshua was uh, from the tribe of Ephraim. I've been really burdened as we unfolding these mantles of priesthood and and of royalty and prophetic I've been really burdened to share with you on the ox some of you know that I've written a book on on an ox and Ephraim was the center called the ox tribe and I've been so burdened to release that word over this church as well I haven't started preaching from that book as yet so Joshua was from the tribe of who Ephraim they were the warriors they were bloodline warriors so they gathered with whatever they had and then Bible says there he was prepared and then comes the rod of God in the scene a man comes called Joshua who's assigned to raise up men for this battle and they are not skilled as yet and then God brought, brings in the scene the rod of God because that's the comfort Joshua gives to Moses I will be in the top hill I'm not allowed to touch the boundary of the battlefield because I'm Levi and I'm connected to heaven and I'm not allowed to touch the bloody body because they will make me unclean but I will be on the hill with the rod of God in my hand what does the rod of God represent in this scene throughout our cultures we see the kings have a scepter what does the scepter represent it represents authority and power of the kingdom now the rod of Moses has been a symbol of miraculous supernatural power of God because it would be the rod that people stretch and the ocean was parted. Amen. It will be the rod that would perform miracles for him in front of Pharaoh. It will be the rod when he will touch the waters of Nile and the waters of Nile will become blood. This rod has been a supernatural rod in the hand of Moses but what does it represent it represents authority and power power and it represents priesthood because the priest will have the rod in his hand the rod represented the priesthood of God and I want to say this whenever there is a rod or scepter they can never be two scepters and two rods they can never be because they can only be one head in the family in the kingdom and even in the in, in the temple they can never be anything that has two heads is a monster There can only be one rod and that rod was spoke of the priesthood order, the Levitical order in the midst of God's people. People who were connected with God and the rod represented that order. It represented God's authority and power and miracle working God and it was in the hand of a Levi. It was symbolic of God's presence and power amongst his people and it was a symbolic of God's priesthood being established that God has handpicked people from this nation called Israel who are connected to him and they are his possession and he is their inheritance every house has a rod 
Every church has a rod. That rod is passed from generations to generations. When I close my eyes or if God removes me from this church, the rod of priesthood which represents the pastoral care or the shepherd in this church will be given to somebody else. But there can never be two rods in one place. The rod moves from hand to hand and it represents the priesthood in the families. It represents it represents the priesthood in the church. It represents authority and power, the priesthood of God amongst his people. A wife can have all that she can say, but the priesthood will remain upon the man. That's how God established it because God gave the rod to the husband and says he is the head. We lived up in a messed up culture and society because we have dishonored the rod and the one that holds the rod. When we honor the priesthood, the blessings flow in the families. And I have seen that in my own personal life as well as in the life of my parents. My father was honored. And I'm not just talking any kind of honor. When he came and sat, we took off his shoes. We brought water for him. We, we, cleaned, his, we, we cleaned his bra with the sweat. All the sweat that was there, we cleaned it. And we, we Abuji, what do you want? you want? Are you hungry? You worked hard. And I should massage him. Why? Because that's how the culture in the house was established. We can make all the suggestions and all the proposals. When he opened his mouth, that is the final word. And the blessings of God were so enriched in our house. Because the priesthood was honored. The rod of God which was established in the priest was honored in the house. Same in the church. Church don't, don't succeed or don't, don't have that much success because the priesthood in the church is not honored. And that's why we are in a mess. Churches are empty all across the world. Because now we have social media and now we can listen to whatever and we know it better than pastor. We know better than those who lead. But there's only one rod and that is the God order and it cannot be touched and it cannot be disturbed. As long as God keeps the priesthood in the church, it must be honored. When God removes the priesthood, the rod will be given to somebody else. But God will not take anything for granted when he establishes a priesthood in a ministry. It's a God order and he cannot allow it to be touched. Tell your neighbor there's only one rod. Tell them you might know it better, but there's only one rod. Hallelujah. Everything that has two heads is a monster. Let's not create the monsters. Because there can only be one rod. Bible says he was standing on the hilltop with his rod. Because they were not allowed to touch the blood. And they were not allowed to be in the battlefield. They were the priesthood of God and could only stand from far and intercede. And the Bible says his hands were lifted up. <laughs> Isn't this amazing? There's two reasons. Because he's on the hilltop and everybody is seeing him. I know we're in the limelight, always, past is always in the limelight. I know if my, my wife, you know, just wears something and then everybody's coming. I know we're in the limelight, we're on the, this hill. With the rod, thank God for the rod. We're on this hill. So there was two reasons for him to be on the hill. Firstly, it represents him lifting up his hands, highlights that his dependency as a leader is upon God. And everybody could see that. His hands are lifted. He's watching them but his hands are lifted. As they get wounded and as they kill, Bible says his hands were lifted. Which represented that he is connected because he's called to be connected. He's a lever, which means to connect. 
that they are not alone in the battlefield and he is connected and as he is connected he is bringing heaven's victory upon the earth in that battlefield second reason his hands were raised to give encouragement to those who watch him as they got tired and as they're fighting because Moses got tired imagine this battle going on for the whole day in the burning sun they looked up and they draw the encouragement and strength from the priesthood order because they have seen the rod of God performing miracles and they have seen Moses using this rod they saw Moses with lifted hand with the rod on his side and they were encouraged if God could do then he will do it again all they need to do is honor 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 and honor will bring victory it was a twofold thing because the priesthood order was there. Now, amazingly, and the man's on top, and you see on the hill, when you see this scene, his hands are lifted, his rod is on his side, and this two men Bible speaks of Aaron and Ur. Aaron and Ur went up to the top of the hill. Aaron was from who? From the tribe of Levi. Aaron was Moses' elder brother, which represented the priesthood what did he represent it do you know Ur was from the tribe of Judah Ur was from where from the tribe of so the Levi produced priest and Judah produced kings so the the priesthood the royal priesthood order was joined on that mountain hill for victory to be established and last week I shared with you Mary the mother of Jesus came from the tribe of Levi and Joseph the father of Jesus came from the tribe of Judah so the Mary of Levi and Judah will bring the fullness of God in the body which was Christ Jesus so the mantle of priesthood and the mantle of kingly or royalty will come together on the mountain top and establish a victory with unskilled men in the battlefield you have Aaron and you have Ur and they is merging and marrying off, marrying off the royal priesthood and wherever there is the merging of these two anointings, victory cannot be denied. Hallelujah. Moses was very specific when he handpicked these two men to go with him because you must understand this. Only in the first Samuel chapter 9, the first king of Israel will be introduced. Then you have the, the first you have the first priest will be introduced from Exodus 28. But he foresaw, and that's what the letter of Hebrew says, he foresaw. He foresaw things to come and held on to the promises. He saw the merging of the priesthood and he saw the merging of the Judaic tribe coming together and fulfilling the royal priesthood. He foresaw Christ in that battlefield as the both anointing came and joined in for the victory. Amen. Bible says his hands were held up and Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. How powerful is that? Amen. That's why the Bible says, strike the shepherd and sheep will scatter. Amen. Priesthood of God in the church, in the ministry, will always be under attack. There will always be people who will have some kind of problem with the priesthood. Why? Because the enemy uses these people to destroy what God has established. The principle remains. This is the biblical order. Not the word of Pastor Gil. This is the word of God. As his hands came down, the enemy started to succeed. Are you with me? That's why enemy will try his level best because there's things that are happening in the church. Enemy can't stand that. 
only strategy he has make his hands heavy let him bring it down so we can have some kind of victory let's swat the shepherd and sheep will scatter let's empty the church but the church belongs to the Lord and the Levites belong to the Lord and the battle get, gets intense but I thank God for the Levites and I thank God for the Judah and I thank God for the Aaron's and her who stand and say we are with you no matter what we will lift up your hands because as God do this work we want to see victory in the lives of people we don't want the enemy to defeat us we will lift up your hands because the priesthood of God must be established in order for us to have victory that's why enemy fights to the nails with the priesthood people rather be traveling evangelist and the apostles and run mission and have compassion ministry then put up with different difficult people in the church there's such a decline of pastors within the churches all across the world discouragement comes in fabricated lies are spoken to discourage the pastors the priesthood can be destroyed and the churches can be abandoned It's not a pleasant job, I can tell you. It's a pastor's month. You know that is pastor's appreciation. I have my first dose of appreciation on Wednesday. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you for appreciating me so much. I love you all. <laughs> so people rather be traveling evangelists and I was a traveling missionary and I enjoyed myself. We went from church to church. We brought revival, prophesied, and we did extraordinary things. And I enjoyed that life. Until you put in a church. <laughs> then you test it. And you wonder, should I go back to be a missionary or an apostle? I have my ordination of an apostle. I can show people the certificate. Listen, I got this apost apostolic ordination for after seven years. I'm attested and I'm approved apostle. We have a couple of churches under our names. We pioneered those churches. We build those churches. Come and listen to us or hear us or have us for a conference. <laughs> Do you know that in the same chapter, verse 4, chapter 17, verse 4, listen to this word. Moses cried out to the Lord for help. Why? He was weeping. When the Bible says he cried out, he was literally weeping. Why he was weeping? What shall I do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. It is happening in the same chapter. Where as a priest is crying out with tears and sobbing and asking God, what shall I do with these people? How am I going to make them happy? They're never happy. They're about to stone me, do something. And in the same chapter, while they complain and God did a miracle, they got water, the enemy comes. And but they but the victory will be dependent on the lifting of the hands of the priesthood of Moses and nothing else. The same people who wanted to stone him just a couple of verses before that. They must be shouting, hey, lift up his hand, I'm getting beaten up. <laughs> We've been defeated when his hand go. Come on, I'm wounded. Lift up his hand so we can have some victory in the battlefield. Same people who wanted to stone him a couple of verses ago. Crying out now in the battle because there was a God order and that God order cannot be touched. They didn't like him. They wanted to kill him. Even to a point where he's crying out and weeping and sobbing before God. But they knew there's a God order. And at Mazet they hate him. They cannot have a victory without his hand being lifted up. These are the biblical principles. Biblical principles. You cannot avoid them. You cannot write them off. It's written in the word of God. Tell your neighbor it's written in the word of God. Thank God for Aaron. 
and Ur. I thank God for many of you. I love you dearly. I thank God for the Aaron and Ur in this house. Amen. You lift up our head, hands and we establish a victory in this place. There has to be an order. Turn your Bible with me to Psalm 133. Bible says, How behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil of consecration poured on the head, coming down on the beard. Whose beard is that? Even the beard of Aaron. Who was Aaron? A Levi. A priest. Coming down upon the edge of his priestly robes. Consecrating the whole body. It is like the dew of the Mount Earth. Coming down the hills of Zion. For the day, for day the Lord has commanded the blessing. Life evermore. He is calling the children of God blessed. And he's calling the place called the hills of Zion. And he says God has commanded a blessing and favor and life evermore. But the order for that blessing is the peace to offer. Because everything falls from the head. There is a spiritual order in the house of God. And in the life of every believer. He says, like the oil falls from the head of Aaron. It falls from his head, goes down. We are the body of Christ, but God establishes a place to within the body. Everything falls from the head. That's why lifting up his hand will bring victory to the field. Everything. If his hands are not lifted, if he doesn't experience the victory, they will not have victory because everything, the oil flows from the head. Tell your neighbor, the oil flows from the head. The royal priesthood of God within the church that has a heart for the shepherds and those who serve them and have a respect for the rod that they carry. You must understand that that rod is not for them to keep. It will move from hands to hand, but there can be no replacement of that priesthood while it is in their hands. Are you with me? Amen. Those who have honored and cherished that order, they will have the blessings because the Bible says God commands a blessing. How will they come together in unity? Is the oil flowing from the priest's head going to his beard? And I'm going to be a thank you, Jesus. And to his priestly robe, right to his feet. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Everything flows from there. Why these things are important? <coughs> Turn the Bible with me to just third John. Verse 2. Verse 2. Behold, beloved. Beloved, I pray that in every way you may succeed. In every way you may succeed and prosper and be in good health physically, just as your soul prospers spiritually. So the condition of your life in the physical, the prosperity and the blessings of God and the physical healing is dependent on the condition of your soul. This is what the word of God. As your soul prospers, it means it's attached. As you prosper in your soul, in spirituality, what happens in your soul will happen in your real life. Are you with me? Pay attention. So the prosperity and blessings of God in your life can only go as far as the condition of your soul. Which is your spiritual life, which is your thought patterns, which is the words that you speak. Because as your soul prospers, you prosper. Are you with me? Amen. Tell your neighbor, as my soul prosper, I prosper. So your physical condition is dependent 
on the condition of your soul. That what the word of God says. Now listen to this. Turn to Bible and read Hebrew chapter 13 verse 17. Chapter 13 verse 17. Listen to this. Obey your spiritual leaders and submit to them. Recognizing the authority over you. For they are keeping watch over your Say, everybody say. Say it loud. And continually guiding, guiding your spiritual welfare as those who will give an account. Listen to this. Let them do this with joy. We don't make their life miserable. And not with grief and groaning. Why? For this would be of no benefit to you. Now, this is very, very crucial because Bible says my prosperity and the blessings and the physical conditions, including healing in my body, is dependent on the condition of my soul. But the soul, my soul, is trusted to the priesthood of God in the ministry. And it boggles me. That that's why spiritual covering comes in. Because your soul cannot have a spiritual covering of his own. You cannot be a God yourself. There is a God of altar of peace to that you must submit to. So your soul cannot submit to you. It will submit to what you do. But she need a spiritual covering. And then Bible says, that's what Bible says, obey your spiritual leaders and submit to their authority. Why? Because they're watching over your soul. In the heavenlies, God establishes a pattern. Those who do not have a spiritual covering, that's why they're suffering in their lives. And those who despise a spiritual covering are going nowhere. It's the word of God. As your soul prosper, you prosper. But your soul is not under your order. It's under the order of a spiritual covering. Because that's what the Bible says. Obey your leaders, your spiritual leaders. And something to them, recognize the thought of you. But they're keeping watch. You keep watch your physical realm. And God establishes a place within your life. Who watch over your soul. And they got you and the protection that the God would honor established in the life of every saint. That's why you must belong to a body. That's why Bible will encourage that you have shepherds, even the apostles and all the, the, the evangelists and the teachers, everybody must have a, a, a pastor. Why? Because they need a priest to order in their lives. Somebody that can counsel them, somebody that can encourage them, somebody that can pray with them. It cannot be challenged. It's in the word of God. He says, let them do this with joy. He said, let them do with this joy and not with grief and growth. For this would be of no benefit to you. It means that it will affect you if they have things that they are not happy with. The word of God. Everybody says the word of God. The word of God. Not the word of pastors, the word of God. The priesthood order. The rod must be honored. It does not matter whose hand it is, it must be honored. They hated most, they wanted to stone him, but they saw the rod in his hand. And they knew that rod in his hand is the presence and power of God. And whoever holds that rod, that rod, they submit to him. Lift up his hand. We need the victory. Listen to this now. Exodus 17. Go back to Exodus 17. Where we were in the battlefield. Verse 14 says, And the Lord said to Moses, Write this in the book of, book as a memorial, and recite to Joshua. You shall and I will utterly wipe out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. 
This, do you know that when God said that He would wipe out their memory from the face of the earth, this was fulfilled in the life of Esther. Because she will kill the last descendants of the men who were the Amman. So they survived from generation to generation, but the curse never left them. Left them. Verse 15 says, Moses built an altar and named the Lord is my banner, Jehovah Nisi. My God. Say Jehovah Nisi. The Lord has sworn an oath. The Lord will have war against Amalek from generation to generation. And I say to you, sometimes you don't realize when you utter words. And when you come up against what, what God is doing and the peace of God, you have no idea the curse lingers around generations and generations. You will be dead and gone, but the curse will linger around your children and your children's children up to four, fifth generation. And for the sake of your children, for the sake of your generation, stop doing and tempting God. Generations and generations of revenge. Not to win this battle until each one of them are wiped out because God does not forget. There's an order of priesthood. He stood in there for the land. They fought for that land. But he would have no part in the fight. I'm not going to fight with you. Over the years, God has burdened our heart. We will go extra mile to bring peace. We'll ask you, we'll call you, we'll sit in your house, plead with you to not do certain things. But I'm not going to fight you. I'm not going to confront you. I'm not called to fight battles. Call over my life is to not fight battles. My wife reminded me of a miracle that happened. In a black township, we served there for nine years as pastors. And I says, I feel that God is maybe giving us a great victory in the church. He says, no, the great victory was in my life. And I want to close with this testimony. I've seen the priesthood order. We built up the church up to the roof level. Doors and windows were not put in and there was no fence. We are still waiting and trusting God for this building to be completed. We had a problem with a Sulu woman. Hold say that's her land. Even though it was given to us and it was given a go ahead to put, to put the church building. She really made her life a mystery. Now imagine going to a Sunday meeting, Sunday service, and your property is fenced. And then, there's a group of people who will not allow you to enter the church. It was heartbreaking. The whole congregation, all of the Muslims, they, was a, they, they wanted to fight. I said, no, we're not called to fight. Long story short, for three months, we're trying to make peace. Nothing is happening. He's a Pakistani. We must go back to Pakistan. And that was the case. And... I remember crying out to God, got my courage, and I remember that weekend, and I, as I got to the community, there was a whole bunch of people following me. They said they want to kill you, they want to be told you to not come, and I was told by a pastor, I was told by the counselor, the ward counselor, don't come to this community. Please, we have heard rumors, they will take you out because they want that land and now it's nicely done and we have already spent maybe two, three hundred thousand rand only, they want it. I says, I am coming and then that time was with the, she was doing a concert in a far land. <laughs> I called her that morning and said, uh, you know, babe, I'm going to go to the community and I just want, to, I just want you to know I love you very much. I need to do this. And I went, broke that fence, and they had put the planks on the entrance door, broke the plank, and we got into the church and we started to have the service. 
The opposite group came now and they are screaming, they're shouting, they're spitting, and there's a chaos. I was in that church, only the children were there, and I, elderly were outside and they wanted to fight, and I said, just go back to your homes, go get the tent, kind of thing. The children, the children were offering and we took care of over 100 Zulu kids. They stood with me and said, we will not leave pastor. They stood day and I called the police. I had mistaken orders. I had some people in a very high profile position who were aware of the situation and they wanted to help. And after two hours, I walked out and these people stood and they swore and they spat. They got into my car and left the community. I was crushed. I was sitting on a heart attack, I want to say to you. We wept before God and cried out before God and says, I'm not called to fight. You take this down. Amen. And remember praying that night, two o'clock, I get a call. Two o'clock. And my wife is witness and she will confirm everything with you. I get a call. Pastor, Pastor, please, please. I can't sleep, I have no peace. Come, come and take this church back. Hallelujah. Next day, I go to this community, this woman's house, who put this fence, weeping and trembling. All her gang was there sitting. Last night, two o'clock, the Lord wakes her up, and they sense the presence of a mighty man in the lounge. And I have still a recording. I put a recorder in my in my pocket in case anything happens to me. They will have some kind of evidence about the place in here. I duck that recorder. This is the story she's sharing. Around two o'clock, there was this man, and he was sitting in the lounge. And she goes to the lounge and she can't look at his face. And she realizes that he's some supernatural entity and she can't really do anything about it. She goes out of the door and she goes to the trees. Trees where she worships her ancestors. Trees where she ties the ropes. And trees where she ties the clothes and prays and everything. And she worshipped and they tried to get some help from her ancestors. And that man stood by the tree and she was shaken. He shook her and says, that little boy you call little boy is my servant. You will not touch him and you will not touch this ministry. She said, brother, this real, this video coming on all the junk she has done. Because she opened once a sewer to the church property. And now all her filth was floating in our churchyard. She, everything she has done, she started to confess. And we were restored back in the ministry. Amen. I've seen the hand of God in Pakistan. And I share with you at the time all the stories. When God establishes you in place. That's why the opposition does not face us. And I will not be intimidated. I have seen the hand of God. I see what I'm called to do. I know what I'm called to do. I know the grace and I know the anointing over my life. I know the unraveling. I know my purpose. I know the rod that I have. I'm not called to inherit or possess the physical. God is my inheritance. Oh, yeah. He is my possession. Oh, yeah. That is what he said. They are my possession. Yes. Means they belong to me. The God of order, the priesthood of the order. In your life as well, as it is, you are the priest of God. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. The priesthood order of God. Even when you are at work, you are a priest of God. You cannot be touched. Amongst your believers, amongst your families. It's not only when you're in full-time ministry. Yes, there's a stronger mental or political order over you. But even wherever you are, 
You are a priest of God. Amen. And do you know what? As he establishes this priesthood order upon that mountain hill, he introduces himself as Jehovah Nisai. That this is my order of the fraud, which is the Lord of the priesthood. And the banner, the flag, all that fraud is Jehovah Nisi. Because it's my name. Blessings over your life. Father, we thank you. 